Hi, and welcome to the Spooky Isles. My name's David Saunderson, and today we're talking to uh, ghost hunter Steve Parsons. How are you, Steve? I'm good, surprisingly well. Hey, and you're doing all right? Circumstances. You're in, you're in Pembrokeshire and uh, Wales. What's uh, what's the lockdown like there? Uh, incredibly warm and sunny, and has been for the last two weeks. We're currently at uh, hang on a minute, 23 degrees outside. Yeah, it looks it's quite it's quite blue skies. It would be holiday season down here in West Wales. This is Easter weekend. You would think yeah. it'd be a wonderful Do time to get out there. Do not come to Pembrokeshire. No, that, that's that's, that's, that's that's what everyone's saying. We're all trying to keep ourselves busy, and we're talking to people around the country about mm -hmm. uh, uh, paranormal investigations and research. And I, I've contacted you because I've always entertained, I've always uh, appreciated your your, your uh, candidness on uh, the. Uh, the, I'm glad I'm entertaining. Anyway. You are you are entertaining. The, I'll call it a ghost hunting industry, and I say ghost hunting, but you, you actually like the term ghost hunter, whereas some people don't like it. I think it's a good old-fashioned term. It was used by Harry Price and others, Elliot O'Donnell, um, way back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. I know in, in recent years there's been some um, debate on uh, on the social media of, uh, and a, establishing a hierarchy, whether a paranormal investigator is is a better thing to call yourself than a ghost hunter because you know a ghost hunter implies that you're not quite as serious um but for me the ghost the, the term ghost hunter it is what it is it, that's yeah. what i do it, it's, it's, a nice, it's, it's a nice quaint british term and it is what harry price called himself so mm -hmm. who, who are we to disagree exactly. with that you can't now, disagree with the master now you, you you're very old school in that respect you know, looking back to the likes of Harry Price, but you you really are one for trying to push in the future mm -hmm. with the, the development of Parascience, uh, which is your, your, your group, at organisation. Can you maybe bring us back to when you became interested in the, in the paranormal? Gosh, I know it's really quite fashionable these days to uh, have a, an interesting backstory or an interesting, ba you know, I remember investigating ghosts when I was on my nana's knee and all that sort of stuff. Uh, for me, it really started as a teenager, or at least I recall it starting as a teenager. Uh, we did a project at school which related to ghosts, and uh, I remember seeing as well in a, an edition of um, the Guinness Book of Records I was bought for Christmas. Um, a small, a little small black and white picture of Britain's the most haunted house in England, mm. and then I, I went to the local library and read up more on that. Uh, however, you reach that that age where your parents start to tell embarrassing stories about you as a child. Now, I always assumed it was a teenage thing, uh, the interest, because I always liked aeroplanes and still do. Mm. Uh, the ghosts I always thought came a little later, um, but apparently not. Apparently, as a five, six, seven-year-old, I used to demand to be taken to places to look for the ghosts. And at age eight, uh, together with a group of friends in the garage, we were making Ouija boards. What? So I have no recollection of that. <laughs> None whatsoever. It's uh, maybe a bit of a savant, really, to be uh, doing that kind mm. of uh, running around as opposed to doing a Scooby-Doo type of uh, ah, ghost I, adventure. I, 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 I don't know why I have absolutely no... Even once they were telling me the stories, I, I had no recollection of them at all. Were you ever successful? Did you ever find anything? Well, as, as I say, I can't remember. <laughs> have you ever found anything? May, may, maybe um, maybe I found something truly horrific and those memories have been erased. That's right. Um, but have you, found, have you found anything in your, uh, in your career? Oh, uh, gosh, yeah. I, I, I don't think you could actually continue to do this unless you had had sufficient number of experiences or uh, occasions where you were uh, put in a position of severely questioning what's taking place. Uh, for me that came a little later, uh, I mean as a child I, I just desperately wanted to see a ghost. You know I'd read Harry Price's books about Borley and I'd read Elliot O'Donnell's and Andrew Green's books and um, but I just desperately wanted to see a ghost. For myself and it seemed to be an incredibly easy thing to do you just go along to a haunted place and you sit on the stairs in the middle of the night and then you know if you're lucky the ghost will 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 come down the stairs and you get to see it it never happened um until uh, it, later on i trained as uh, a nurse registered nurse i was i was the duty nurse in charge of a uh, a twilight home for the criminally bewildered uh, the elderly community and they 
one of the duties at night was to you know, do walk arounds and things. And I'd been off for a couple of days. And uh, as I, when I returned to duty, there'd been an agency uh, staff nurse in charge. And there wasn't really a lot of point in doing a handover to me because they didn't know them and I did and I could check anyway later. So they, they set off home and I started my, my walk around just to make sure everything was where it should be. Uh, make sure that we'd had no escapees and to block up all the tunnel entrances. And there was a, an elderly gentleman in the corridor on the first floor where exactly where he should be. Uh, this was a, a, the gentleman was one of a married couple and they had adjoining rooms. And one of the things that we did every night was to put them together into the same room uh, with, with uh, a mug of cocoa and woe betide as if we were late. He wasn't very mobile and he would set off down the corridor to, to visit his, his wife. And uh, it was a little later and he was in the corridor uh, making his way towards his wife's room. So I, I said to him, if you, you know, if you go back in, I'll make sure one of the girls come and collect you. And then he said, I've just, I'm just going to say good, goodbye to Elsie, his wife. Um, so I continued on got down to the ground floor and said to the, the girls, um, when you finished your handover and your tea, do you want to go and put, put Ernie in with Elsie? And they said to me, you're being funny. I went, no, I'm just going to put Ernie in with Elsie. He's wandering in the corridors. And they looked at me and again said, you know, are you playing a prank on us? And I went, look, you see those blue epaulets there? That means I get to tell you what to do. And at which point they said uh, that Ernie had passed away two days earlier uh, whilst I've been off duty I went well he's very much not passed away and very much walking up and down the corridor um, and it, it passed that, that moment passed they thought I was playing a prank on them um, until oh, four or five hours later around about midnight and uh, one of the uh, more senior of the care staff there was a commotion on the stairs and she was she fled the building. She was making for the door. I came out of the office in an attempt to intercept her and she said, Ernie's walking around in the corridor. <laughs> well, I did tell you. So this obviously sort of plays into the idea that, I mean, there's many types of uh, real ghost sightings, but mm -hmm. you obviously thought this bloke was as solid as you or I now. He, he, there was absolutely nothing that was... Unt uh, that was unusual or untoward about the, the encounter later on perhaps you know I, your mind starts to consider what what took place particularly after i'd gone into the office and checked and found that he had indeed died uh, and i do recall then he'd said he was going to say goodbye not good night yeah uh, to elsie now whether he that was what he'd actually said or whether that was something that i retrofitted to the uh, yeah. experience but there was nothing in the experience. It, it was a matter of less than 10 seconds. Uh, as we passed in the corridor, I was perhaps 10 feet away from him. He had his back to me originally and then turned to face me. So it was fully interactive. Uh, and it was everything I would have expected the, the encounter to have been. My, my sister's a registered nurse in Australia. And she tells me, a, not a dissimilar story, but a, a story that, uh, you know, nurses and you know she's an aged care home and she mm -hmm. and she and it's not uncommon for them to see oh. you know things like that which i which and and, it, and she, my sister is a sane person she's not someone that i would uh discount nor would do, i do you know so. i i i don't know a single nurse um or hospital worker care home worker who doesn't have an account a story of a paranormal experience now, obviously, stories spread like wildfire around, around some of the care homes or the wards of the hospitals. But nonetheless, um, I, 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 I repeat, I don't know a single nurse that doesn't have their own first-hand experience. Yeah, and I suppose when you're dealing with so much death, as a matter of fact, because mm -hmm. it is a daily experience, mm -hmm. people are dying, you do get become matter-of-fact about certain things. And, and when my sister tells it, it's just... Just, just happens that apparently in this, uh, it's very near to a, a river, a creek, mm -hmm. and they see when someone's going to die, they there's two children seen in the in the corridor, and then people see it, mm -hmm. okay, and that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and she's not the kind of person. I don't know if she's seen it, 
because I can't really remember the story she told me, but it's something that uh, must happen. Did you see anything else in your in your in your nursing career? Not, uh, I mean, I knew I knew of stories, and there were there were moments where uh, you were put in a position of what just what what just happened, but they were in, they were relatively inconsequential. But you talk about nursing homes and and the two children. Uh, one of them I worked, one nursing home I worked in, uh, always had the story. It had been a uh, in a previous existence, this large building had been um, a convent or a home where the nuns lived. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the residency for nuns. That nunnery. A nunnery or a convent or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, and there had been this recurring story of a nun uh, who came to collect the souls of those who died. And this was clearly a story that was passed from every member of the staff knew this story. Yeah. And uh, we were on duty one night and there was, there was a glass partition wall between us and the corridor. And we did have a patient, uh, a resident, who we didn't expect to see out the night and we'd been taking it in shifts to sit by the bed. Um, and the family were you know, quite, com- uh, quite a distance away. And so I'd, I'd gone down to the office to check on their progress because we were hoping that they would get there before the inevitable was going to happen um and when i came back this the 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 other members of the staff were saying that they they, they were actually looking at the glass partition and saying that they'd seen a figure uh, this dark figure uh, the nun the nun of death or <laughs> walking up the corridor i went yeah that won't be that that'll be the one from room the wanderer we'll go we'll go collect her um, but they said, no, 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 wait, wait. There's somebody already up there. Um, just, just wait. And then apparently, I, I still had work to do. So uh, a few minutes later, one came in and said, we can go up now because she'll, she'll have died. I said, I was, I was come down and told you. Said, no, no, the figure's gone the other way. Gone back down the corridor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, th- these are stories. And the, the stories are endlessly fascinating, um, yeah. you know. All of the hospitals I've worked in, or you know, many of the wards which were built in the 1920s, 1930s, some of them were older Victorian uh, buildings, uh, all had, you know, there was phantom matrons who would visit sick patients in the middle of the night. There were, um, there were all manner of stories, accounts, and tales. The, the, it's, it's all the stuff we love here at the Spooky oh, Homes, yeah. anyway. So it's, it's all it's all it's, it's all good because I mean, you talk you talk to a lot of people and you you ask them you know what they saw and it's usually a creak or a, an orb or something where you're you've got actually got a little bit of tail behind it to give a. Well, you know, I, as I say, most of the hospitals uh, here in the UK, are the, the, a lot of the the older Victorian hospitals, which are still being used by the NHS, uh, the the number of matrons who were killed by a bomb in world war ii or or succumbed to to some plague whilst caring for the children on a ward who continually come back to visit in the dead of night and comfort the sick and the dying um is incredible yeah so it's true well these are these are stories that you learn in your work when you're not supposed to be ghost hunting or not you know it just happens to you What about the stuff where you've actually actively gone out there to find out what's going on? Uh, in terms of having an experience whilst doing it? Or, or just had, yes, but also, uh, to, uh, have you been as fortunate to, uh, like the one you said about the, the old chap who, uh, who died no, you know, a couple no, of days in before? No, in, in all of the years that we've been uh, with Parascience and before and subsequently, um, never. Um, not once. We've so, we've certainly been in situations where challenging events have taken place that we are we found very difficult to explain. Perhaps the most bizarre, and people can go to the Parascience website um, afterwards after this interview. Yeah, and we'll put we'll put that in the in the bit. bit and if they check out, uh, I don't know what it would be entitled. It would be the former school building in Birkenhead. Um, and the the voices. Now, what took place was we. This was a Victorian school building that had been converted for use as small startup business units. So each of the classrooms had been subdivided into uh, individual offices and units. And a lot of the staff that were working there had reported uh, school-type 
phenomena. So the sounds of children, the sounds of piano playing was a common one, or or the sounds of running feet in the corridors. And uh, the staff who were working in these units, uh, a lot of them were there late at night, and that seemed to be the predominant time for these uh, these sort of uh, reports. So we spent some time uh, by day and sort of into the late evening. And uh, on one occasion, we, we were there with uh, ourselves, our team of about six from Parascience. And we'd also, because it was their building, uh, we'd also had along about six members of the different sort of little offices and startups. So there was about 12 people in total in the building. And what we'd done is over the, the building consisted over three floors. And so on, uh, we had uh, several video cameras, several audio recorders um, on the different floors. And there'd been a, uh, an episode, a sound episode that had taken place during one of the sessions previously. And I'd gone back to uh, the staff room, which we were using with the tea and coffee, uh, to have a listen, listen back on one of the recorders. So I had a big pair of earmuff headphones on and was listening to that then whilst the rest of them were out sitting sitting around the building with the lights on. Um, I add that because we don't always sit in the dark and this building had electricity so we were able to put the lights on albeit they were subdued. And uh, when people came back about 20 minutes later there was obviously something had happened because there was a great deal of excitement and sort of uh, there was an obvious air of excitement but the members of the team are forbidden to talk to one another about what's taken place until they've, you know, we, we, we're sure that they had all the written notes, so that they couldn't sort of invent a story or create yeah, a story. Yeah. Yeah. But that that hadn't applied to the members of the uh, the people, the, the workers, the building workers, and uh, it was obvious something had taken place. And eventually, you know, quite quickly, the story came out that people had heard running, playing, singing, uh, playground noises. Now this was, I think it was well after one o'clock in the morning when this was taking place. What was, to cut the, the story short, uh, el there were eight or nine different recorders, all of which recorded this event. And out of the 12 people in the building, 11 people all heard this event, which went on for about seven minutes and consisted of uh, running, uh, the sound of running, children singing or, or perhaps chanting a playground rhyme. It's not, very, it's not very distinct, but what was most interesting is that every recorder, now some of these recorders are at opposite ends of the building, so they were 50, 60 meters apart and on different floors. When we look back at the levels uh, of the recordings, the level was identical at every recorder. There was no difference in the level, which we would have expected if it had been near it's one end or yeah. the other, or if it had been outside, you know, on one one side of the building than the other. And we spent several uh, months going back and forth, uh, putting people outside, having them sing, chant, move about, trying to replicate it. We never were able to. Uh, I say 11 out of the 12 people heard it because there was one person who was wearing a big pair of muff headphones listening to yeah. something else. <laughs> and I was the only one that didn't hear it. But there's an excerpt from that on, on the Parascience website. And that's always been intriguing. Well, tell us a little bit about it. It is intriguing. I'm, we're going to have a look at that. I'll, I'll certainly look at that after we've mm -hmm. uh, done this video. Tell us about Parascience. How did that come about? It came about uh, out of frustration. Uh, we I had joined a local... This was oh god 26 seven years ago now i joined a local paranormal group and they these were very few and far between back it back then um, and this this was just one of these little inconsequential groups of people who would visit haunted locations and i went along and um it was it was interesting and it was fun and we had uh, my love of technology started to take over. And uh, in the group was later to be my colleague uh, in Paris, Anne Winsper, Dr. Anne Winsper now. And uh, we, we were called the evidence team 
because of our love for tech and our sort of desire to capture some some form of proof evidence and we had very rudimentary equipment um, we did have a mini disc recorder we had uh, an extremely expensive digital camera that there is all of 0.8 of a megapixel and these uh, i don't know if anybody remembers them these extremely cheap baby monitor type cctv cameras the problem with the systems is we quickly started to realize that what we were capturing evidence of is members of the ghost hunting team uh, of which we were part uh, deliberately making stuff happen moving stuff throwing stuff around uh, led by uh, it became apparent that this was very much led uh, or, or buttering the ego of the group leader at the time a dynamic sort of figure who wanted everybody to think that he was um, you know the, the, a forerunner of Derek Akora I mean, this is well before this is well before the time of the. I mean, obviously, with most haunted coming, it was the big one. Oh, this, was that. Before this, that. this sounds like it was long before that. So, I mean, the the idea that people were making a bit of a trying to make a name for themselves to get you know on he television. Was, it, it was he wasn't he had no desire to go on television, but he it, 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 there was a lot of ego massaging going on within the group. Um, he was getting a great deal of uh, respect from the group members. Um, and there was also a sort of, you know, he, he was using it with some of the female members as well. But what became readily apparent is that he was the cause of most of the things that were taking place. And uh, we started to lay traps, um, the simplest, most basic traps. And every single time we, and it, it came to a head and uh, Anne and I were asked to leave. Um, and so, and that's when parasites came from then, or yeah, is it? Yeah, because we yeah. realised, you know, we sat down and we said, look, if we're going to do this, you know, we we both had a good sound knowledge of science, uh, and was a pharmacy technician, uh, I I was a nurse, and we realised that there was only go if, if we were going to answer the questions that we were setting ourselves, then we had to use the scientific principles we were taught at school, yeah. basic simple experiments. Um, and you know to working to a standard and we called the group you know we, we, we called what we were doing paranormal science yeah and that became shortened and that's how we got the name okay now we were talking just before about uh most haunted now you've appeared on most haunted so you've <laughs> kind of done the whole level of from doing the stuff at the on a 8.8 .8 meg sort of little camera to seeing it yourself in your own uh, work life mm -hmm. how does it all compare most Haunted is a fantastically entertaining television program. It exists to sell advertising revenue. That's its sole purpose. Um, it, I, I suppose there might have been a more altruistic uh, desire in the very early seasons, one and two, um, from Carl and Yvette and the other members of the team to actually fight, to do what I was doing years earlier, go out and want to see a ghost find out for yourself but of course later on as soon as you, you then take that to them to the media um, you need you have to play for the audience you have to get the viewers to sell the advertising revenue to make the program successful and, and so very quickly it starts to spiral very quickly you see you see with all of the programs they start off simply walking around uh, the building at night with the cameras uh, by two or three episode series in, the, the those ghosts are passe. The, the the pair of legs walking down the steps uh, at the at the theatre is very very passe. The headless figure drifting silently down the corridor. What they want then is murderers and cohorts and victims, yeah. and then that becomes passe. And then they start to look for demons and they start to become confrontational and, and have to rid the world of these malevolent forces and that's what do, we say do, do you think you can do an authentic tv show that isn't boring um yes i i actually genuinely believe that you can uh, i don't think that one exists yet and uh, which is unfortunate because science itself isn't boring i mean look at brainiac and and other programs where they they do portray science kids love science um and I, I don't think that science itself is intrinsically boring. Uh, I think it. I think one of the ways of, uh, and, and I do this a lot with, with uh, the public investigations that I do from time to time, which is uh, 
use ed entertainment as a way of reaching out and educating. So ed edutainment, I call it, yeah. because it, it you can't lecture to people and go, no, oh, that doesn't work. You shouldn't be doing it that way, and you know, finger wag wagging and tutting. But if you allow people to find out for themselves to explore for themselves so give them the items of equipment give them the the sls cameras give them the 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 different meters and allow them to and encourage them to question what it really means uh, and sometimes that requires a little bit of showmanship and uh, you know hidden magnets under under things so that they can detect something and go see well that's how it's done but as long as they know that afterwards, that's what oh, they were showing. Yeah. You can never walk away without the without revealing the truth. That would be unethical. But, but yeah, absolutely, show and tell and allow them to. There's nothing worse when, when people go on public ghost investigations. Uh, there's nothing worse than being dragged from room to room, watching a group of, you know, the team. Right, now we're going to do table tipping. Now we're going to do pendulum dousing. Now, because there is a real disconnect there between the the experience of the the person who's paying to be there, and they're not really given the opportunity to to become to 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 understand what's taking place. And they're they're quite expensive. Some of these. Oh, uh, incredibly expensive. So for to, to be just there watching something, people, other people doing. You, you want I mean, to get if in you're there fortunate, and... you might get invited to rest a hand on a table or. Uh, but it's very much a passive experience. What I've always liked to do is, my job is to facilitate and to mentor. So I want them to go out there. I want them to, they've got, you, know, you give them the tools or no tools often. Um, and then you, you get them to question their experiences and, and understand the experience that they're having. And hopefully they go away with a little more insight into um, the nature of what we do as ghost investigators. Now you uh, you work closely with the SPR, the Society of Psychical Research. Now you mm -hmm. recently published some papers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, the most recent one was last year. With the, there'd been a there'd been a disconnect. Uh, I'd been apparent there'd been a disconnect between um, the 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 ghost hunting community, which is quite extensive in the UK, um, and the academic side. Uh, the academics, there had been there had been a sort of increase in the or, or a move towards parapsychology and academic psychology within the Society for Psychical Research, and no real desire to reach out towards the ghost hunting community. Now that was leaving a vacuum, and that vacuum was being filled by the community itself, and so you were ending up with uh, all manner of strange techniques and devices and, and methods and ideas that were, that, and nobody uh, coming forward to say, well, hang on a minute, have you thought about what you're doing and what this means? And the SPR were in a perfect position that with their 140-year history and their vast resources and uh, in terms of case law. Um, that wasn't happening and so the 2016 conference I rather forcefully explained to them that they needed to reach out and they needed to make the connection and they needed to start by looking at the guidance notes for investigators which were written in 1968 mm. and hadn't been amended in the past 50 years. So I assume uh, they had no video recording or anything like that on those old notes? They had some very interesting ideas, one of which, uh, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that's still relevant. I mean, nothing's really changed with the basics. Um, but there were some interesting ideas about how to, for example, how to deal with uh, suspected hoax, uh, which is to take a black cloth bag, pop it over the head, and then tie the hands behind the back with cotton. Uh, now, that might be tempting, um, but it's nowadays considered to be unethical. And, of course, if we look back at you know, the Enfield case, uh, that much that much lauded case that took place in the 70s the idea of having two male investigators in the bedroom with two sleeping teenage yeah. girls these days uh, would be you know an absolute ethical no-no but as society changes but this book had never been adapted yeah I, I, so I'm I you know one of the first challenges was to get them to reinvent uh, the guidance notes and to reach out more and that I have to say, the SPR has responded uh, readily um, and willingly. The guidance notes they were published in 2018, and they 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 held last year uh, two study days for the ghost hunting community. 
Uh, now, the, the, the plan is that we, we should have had more already, but all of the planning is on hold at the moment. Yes. Um, for obvious reasons. But they will go ahead. So there will be more. And these will be taken out around the UK. They won't just be in London. Um, and the most recent was the, the requirement. It was coming from um, uh, the community, the ghost hunting community, who were asking questions pertaining to the use of equipment because every ghost hunter loves their gadgets. And uh, we we realised quite quite read, uh, quite quickly during last year when we were uh, rolling out the guidance notes and introducing the guidance notes at talks and presentations that a lot of the questions were pertaining to the equipment and that there was a need for guidance notes specifically for the equipment use. Yeah. And the SPR's response was, right, well, we'll we'll write them. Um, off you go and write them. <laughs> so, so that's what so, they've got me doing this year. So that's you're currently working on that project at yeah. the moment, writing yeah, that. Yeah, so. for publication next spring. Okay, well, we we look forward to that. In the meantime, have you got anything else coming up? Because obviously that's a big bit of work. But uh, what uh, what are your well, plans for the next couple of months besides uh, going back and forth to the months, shop? The, yeah, the diary for the next couple of months is just scored out. I'm afraid. Um, ordinarily, I would have gone to. I normally go to America in the autumn. Uh, for two weeks uh, but I think this year I think 2020 has been kind of cancelled it just kind of has you've got uh, your, your, your young ones uh, doing a diary you tell me before about yeah, uh, the historic I, times we live in well it occurred to me that uh, this is a truly historic event that we're going through and I I think that there's a lot of uh, talk about it but I I I, I I like history and I like watching the historical, you know, sort of the documentary programs. And only a few months ago, by, by, by happen chance, I, I saw a documentary on the Spanish flu, uh, the 1920s pandemic, and which was the last big pandemic, global pandemic that we had. Um, and they, they were talking to uh, survivors of the, or people that lived through the, the pandemic. Uh, these have been recordings that were made, interviews that were made uh, in the 70s and 80s. And I realized that actually my children will be that generation in the future. Yeah. And one is nine and one is six years old. And memory can be a, a vague and fragile thing, particularly in the electronic age. We don't write diaries. We don't have uh, a cardboard box full of photographs under the bed. Yeah. Uh, electronic diaries can, you know, the format format can be erased and lost, and we yeah. we lose the information, or it's kept on the cloud somewhere. And so, what we've tried to do is to go back to some of the old-fashioned uh, principles of getting them to sit down and keep a diary of what they did during the great pandemic of 2020. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in 50 years; none of us do. But I think something as truly historic, uh, this will change the world. Mm. Um, I think it, I think it already has. Really, yeah. the world has has changed probably forever, and it will be. You know, it's a moment to live through. Yeah, and we will. So, on that point, we'll uh, leave it there, Steve. Uh, we'd love to get you back again. We've only really just scratched the surface on some of your experiences, some of your thoughts about paranormal. I know I could put the. <laughs> At least it didn't get to rant. <laughs> well, uh, well, maybe we'll do that the next time. But uh, because I know I could just press record, leave the room, and come back and uh, have have another video. Well, we, so, uh, well, we have there you go. That's, what we, we, that's, a, that's a good looking mask. So anyway, you take care of yourself, and what we will uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll talk again. Okay. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.